and just welcome everyone to this week's core volunteer training. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics relating to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's specific topic is going to be celebrating our work together through storytelling. We're going to have a chance to join Citizens Climate Radio host, Peterson Toscano, for a special opportunity to share your own success stories from the field and really have the chance to start learning about the process of framing your own story about climate advocacy to inspire change. Now, our wonderful host tonight, Peterson Toscano, in addition to co-leading the Susquehanna Valley chapter of CCL, Peterson Toscano is the host of CCL's monthly show, Citizens Climate Radio, available wherever you listen to podcasts. If you haven't had a chance to uh, check out any of those shows that have been dropping, there's once a month. A playwright, an actor, and a scholar, Peterson highlights people's stories and their successes as they pursue climate solutions. As a public speaker and a Bible scholar, Peterson has also promoted equality for LGBTQ people and now applies those skills to address climate change as a human rights issue and one that requires artists as well to help us understand it. He has presented at many CCL international conferences, regional conferences, and is one of our favorite speakers on this circuit. So we are so grateful to have you share your time tonight, Peterson. And with that, the floor is yours. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I love the power of stories, and I love helping people tap into their imagination. And just so you know what to expect, uh, this is going to be very interactive. It's definitely not one of these presentations where I'm just going to be talking and you're going to be listening, but there'll be multiple opportunities to engage and to get involved. And here in CCL, we, we have um, a wonderful model of, of a man who started CCL, um, Marshall Saunders, who uh, it, came up with this idea of getting citizens to engage. And, and, and he had some models to, to look at, but he, he was told that it was a foolish thing to, you know, to consider going into, um, you know, getting citizens to do this. And Marshall passed away, sadly, in, um, in December. Uh, but he was a man of great wisdom and depth. And I want to share a very brief video that I created um, based on an interview I did with him a couple of years ago. And it always gives me chills down my spine because he just kind of talks about the power of us, of everyday normal people doing extraordinary things. And it is trusting that ordinary people can get the job done. It's a, it's a trusting in ordinary people. You know, not people who have made it, not people who are powerful, but ordinary people. You know, and if people are not demonstrating that, well, they can. They can. They need a little encouragement, a little breakthrough, like I had. So, you know, it's one step at a time. So in today's um, webinar time that we have together, we're, we're definitely going to be looking at uh, storytelling. In our agenda, you know, we're going to help you understand a little bit more about the power of story. And one thing I often remind people of why storytelling is so important is because we listen to stories with a different part of our brain. So like if you hear someone giving information, a lecture, that's in this very critical part of our brain. But as soon as you shift and you say, once upon a time, uh, once upon a time, uh, we, um, um, when we say something like once upon a time or, or let me tell you a story, that, that changes, it shifts to this other part of our brain, which is far less critical. And people are able to take in information that they normally are, are struggling to accept. And it also can get to the heart of the matter. I recently interviewed, um, uh, Hannah 
Pickard, who's from NOKI, which is a great organization, the National Network of Climate Change Interpreters. And at NOKI, they uh, did a ton of research. They got a huge multi-million dollar grant to try to figure out what, what works with messaging. And I want to share just a minute 44 from this recent interview I had with her, uh, where you can hear about two values, two values that are really important to, to lean on when we're telling stories so that it's this values first. So what I'll be doing with this video and the next one that comes up shortly afterwards is I'm I'm scaffolding a conversation so that will help you to put a story together. So here you're going to learn about values and in a very important pivot. So just sit back and enjoy the video. And if you can't see it, let me know. Hannah stresses effective climate communication begins with messages that are formed around our values. She shares two values that have been proven to move people to action. Protecting the people and the places that we love and or responsibly managing our resources. Those are two values that are very strong within American culture. When I say American culture, I mean really broadly. It gets reinforced in a lot of different ways. Protecting the people and the places that we love and or responsibly managing our resources. Those two values also allow us to align climate action with other social issues. And the more we can align with and connect social issues together, the better we're gonna be and the better we're gonna find solutions that actually work for everybody. We need to shift as climate communicators, as like a field, to painting the picture of what this looks like when we've achieved our goals, because it's so much easier to sustain long-term action when you know what you're, what you're trying to achieve, as opposed to what you're trying to avoid. How, how we center climate communications around the vision for the future, that's not just one of survival, but is one where we would be excited to live in that. Uh, and so she talks about these two values and it's, you know, what is it that is inspiring us to act? Uh, and she does also talk about it's helpful if you can connect it to some sort of a social issue when you're talking about climate change. We'll get to the future thing in a moment. So the two values she talks about, you know, are the value of protecting the things that you love, people, places, things, pets, and responsible management. That, that this been, has been shown that when you, that so many people share this value and when they feel that, that the thing that they love, for instance, is threatened, they will act to the point of seeing a policy change. And there's lots of research that shows that. So I'm gonna have us break into breakout groups in a moment. And in these breakout groups, there's two questions I want you to consider. And that is, of those two values that we talked about, protecting the people and places, things you love, or responsible management, which one inspires you more? And is there a social issue you can connect to this? And when I say social issue, it could be, you know, a real intense social justice issue. So for me, for instance, uh, I'm, I don't have any children, um, but as a, as a gay man, I really feel that LGBT youth who are homeless are kind of my kids that I feel responsible for. And um, they have a really hard time because they're living on the streets. They've often had a lot of discrimination and it's hard to even go to shelters. So one of my values to protect the things that I love is connected to looking out for LGBTQ youth. Other social issues, though, could be things like, you know, outdoor activities, you know, being someone who really enjoys and promotes outdoor activities, uh, social issues about community building. So you're going to have a chance in your breakout groups to, to have this conversation um, where you'll talk about what values inspire you to act of those two. You can talk about another one that does, but of those two in particular, which is the one that moves you more? And could you connect it to some sort of a social issue that's also meaningful to you, where you can see, oh, I guess I care about this issue because it ties in with this value. 
Uh, you're going to have time in breakout groups. You're going to be in groups of three, uh, and you're going to be in these breakout groups for four minutes. So you get about a, a minute each. Uh, and to decide on who goes first, whoever lives the furthest west can go first, and then you figure it out from there. So, um, all right, people are coming back. Um, so, so, so far what we're talking about is having a discussion that's based in a value. And what's great about these values is it doesn't matter if you're progressive or conservative, all Americans share a lot of these two, these two values. Um, it really is not along party lines. Uh, it may be different things they may want to protect, different resources, like for someone who's more conservative, they may be more concerned about the economy uh, as the resource to protect. Um, but, but the same value can, you know, resonates as long as you can articulate, you know, what it is that you care for and why. But this is the big shift that I want you to do with this storytelling. We've been hearing stories about how awful climate change is for a long time, and that does not motivate most people to action. A handful, perhaps. But most people, it just freaks out and they shut down. But what's very powerful is if we can talk about the future and what the impacts our solutions will have. And for that, we need to unlock our imaginations because our brains have been hacked <laughs> by so much discouragement. And so I have for you a three minute thought exercise that Sean Daig, uh, a CCL volunteer put together and I created this film to go along with it. Uh, and this will, um, what I'm asking you to do is allow yourself to imagine and really tap into your senses. The, the exercise is to help you imagine a world without fossil fuels and how it will feel and smell and look different. So if you want, have a notebook out, if thoughts come to you, hopefully your brain will start to fire and you'll tap into your senses. When we talk about what the future looks like in climate change, we often talk about all the bad things that happen. And that's important, that's an important part of the story, but it's important to think about how the world would just change and a lot of these are, are good changes and really like think through kind of all of our senses about what that would be like just imagine this whole new world you walk out your front door what would actually look different in a world where we've gotten off of fossil fuels like as you look around as you look at homes, what's different about them? How are they different than they are today? What's in your driveway? How's that different? How do you get around? What do you see in the world that you didn't before? What's missing? And not just what you see, but engage your other senses. What does the world smell like? What smells are missing that were there before? What do you, what do you smell that you never could before because it was covered over in pollution? What does the world sound like? What does your street sound like? How is that different than it was before? What new things are you hearing in your yard, on your front door, in your neighborhood? You know, what do things feel like, like when you touch them, right? We used to have light bulbs that changing a light bulb would burn your hands and we don't anymore just everyday objects in our in our homes uh, outside how do they feel different how does just walking along the street feel different and how does that make you feel what are the things that that we have gained? What are the things that we have lost?
just imagine this whole new world. Because if we can't imagine this world, we can't create it. We can't imagine this world, we can't create it. So this is what I want you to do is um, in the chat, I want you to begin to type in what you heard, what you think might be missing in this world, um, all the things that come up. And feel is the hard one. Um, and I think I feel like, how is it going to feel different to breathe? Like if you've lived in a city all your life with a lot of pollution and you suddenly go to the countryside, it feels different. It doesn't burn. So in the chat, begin to share what came up in your imagination of what we will experience in it's so important for us to get a sense of what it is that we're fighting for and to be able to communicate that. Because a lot of these things, even if someone, climate change wasn't an important thing, these are important things to people. Um, having cities that are like this, having jobs, these are all things that are important to all kinds of people, even if they don't see themselves as an environmentalist or a climatey person. These things are all really important. So, Getting back to our presentation, Catherine Hayhoe I had on the show some time ago and she said, for long, for long term action, we need hope, rational hope, realistic hope, not Pollyanna hope, but we need hope and a vision of a better future. When we talk to people, the number one most important thing to convey to people is hope for a better future. And that hope is a belief that you, that you actually do believe in the solutions that you're talking about and you understand their impact. So I'm gonna share a story for you where I'm gonna to try to tie in all these things, the values, the future, what I want it to have, social issue that's meaningful to me. And I'm gonna tell you a new kind of climate story, my, my climate story. So my parents come from New York City, Pete and Anita Toscano, that's my sister Dina, and I'm in my mom's belly at the moment in this, when this photo was taken. But they lived in the Bronx, New York, it was loud, it was dirty, it was dangerous, and they moved to Stanford, Connecticut for a new life. And um, my, my dad worked as, a, um, as a, a welder and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. So in our neighborhood, we, um, we lived in this neighborhood in Connecticut and my mom, for her, it was the best of times. She had a group of supportive friends. My sisters and I, we had all sorts of friends we could play with. We didn't have a big house, a fancy house, but it was nice. And my first memory though, is not a happy memory. My first memory when I was three years old was a memory with a lot of fear, a lot of panic, a lot of confusion and loud noises. In my first memory, uh, I felt like I was suffocating uh, and I couldn't breathe. And there I was being jostled around and I found myself in a hospital in a, a oxygen tent surrounded by strangers. I was having an asthma attack, the first of what would be many asthma attacks. My mom couldn't be with me at the hospital most of the time because back in those days, they kept parents away from the ICU unit. And my mom was terrified, like what was going on with me? And we discovered that our neighborhood was dangerous, not because of crime, but because of the pollution. And it wasn't just of me, it was true of everyone in my classroom, in my kindergarten class. I was actually the only white kid in my kindergarten class. Everybody else was African-American, but we all had asthma. My mom, who's like, you know, I'm gonna protect my family at all costs. She's like, we're gonna figure out what to do to make you better. So I, she took me to a specialist. I had to get weekly shots to help me, but none of it worked. I just got worse. I was weak. I didn't gain weight. I was often pale. I couldn't run around and play with my friends. So one summer, my mom did something radical. She packed my sisters and me in the car and we drove up to the countryside where my father's parents had just moved after they retired. And it was dark and scary and weird noises and there weren't a lot of people. And at first I didn't like it at all, but something amazing happened that summer. I felt so much better. I gained weight. I stopped wheezing. I stopped having asthma attacks. That whole summer I was fine. And my mom realized that we had to move because especially when we went back to Connecticut, I had an asthma attack again. And fortunately for my parents, 
they were able to move. It was hard. My dad had to, you know, get seasonal work and we struggled financially, but we found a community that welcomed us, which isn't always true. You know, as a white family, we found this community up in the mountains with mostly white people and they welcomed us. I don't know if that's true of everybody, but we found a place. And as a result, I never had an asthma attack again. And my hope is that no matter who you are, no matter your race, your, your class, no matter if you live in the city or the country, that you could live in the place that you love and breathe good, clean, fresh air, that you're gonna be at a place where your friends and your families are and there are opportunities. You don't have to flee because of pollution because I believe everyone has the right to breathe good, clean air. And so that is why I'm fighting to put a price on carbon. I wanna decarbonize our economy because I wanna take this stuff out of the air and I wanna have air that's clean and good and wholesome for all of us. And so that's what I'm fighting for, for climate change. And that's why I'm excited about it. And that's why I'm excited that you're in this fight with me. So that's where I tried to put all these different elements together. Now it's time for you to get back into breakout groups in a moment um, because I want you to begin to put together a story for yourself. So in telling these new kinds of stories, we want to talk about the many benefits of climate solutions and why they're so meaningful to us. So in a moment, I'm going to have you get into a breakout group, but I'm going to give you a few moments to think before you go, like two moments of us just sitting silently and thinking where you will connect a personal story from your life about anything connected to a value that you have, possibly a social concern and a possible and, and an impact of climate action. It's a lot to ask. That's why I'm giving you a chance to think about it. And feel free to chat with me directly if you need to, but I'm gonna give you two minutes to just think about this and see if you can come up with your own story. So my value was protecting the people and places that we love, which my mom's was too. The social issue was that everyone should breathe good air and everyone should be able to do it. People shouldn't have to escape. And so the impact of climate change is when we have climate change action in place, air will be cleaner in all places, particularly the cities where I had to flee. So I'll give you two minutes to think about that and what your own story might be. Don't worry if it's not all coming together. It took me months to get my story together, but you're just trying to put these elements together, just the pieces, even when you come together in your group. You're gonna be in groups of two, and you're gonna be in that group for five minutes. So you got about two and a half minutes each to just sort of say, well, I'm thinking maybe this, 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 this story might connect with it, it's a brainstorming session. I don't expect anyone to walk away with a fully formed story, okay? Not if you're okay with that, yeah. So um, you're gonna get together and just share with your partner um, kind of what you've come up with or what you're beginning to come up with. The person who lives the furthest east can begin. And Brett, could you put us into breakout groups of two for five minutes? Welcome back. Welcome back. I don't expect anyone to have a fully formed, complete story. Um, but one thing I want you to recognize is that when I told my story, if I had just started telling you that story, you wouldn't know that it was a climate story up front, unless you were one of my friends, because then you know everything I say ultimately leads to climate change. But other than that, you, it was just me telling a story about my childhood. And that's a really good way to start your story. Just tell a good story that's important to you, that's part of your life. It's a gift that you give to somebody when you tell your story and then tell it with compelling details. Like in my story, I had lots of details about how I was feeling and, um, and maybe what I saw, that's really powerful. And then at the very end, I made the pivot. I made the connection to climate change. And this can work really well when uh, you're writing an article, when you're giving a talk, it's really important. So I'm just gonna give people a chance in the chat to just type in a few things like kind of what were some of the elements of your story? What was the story that you, you were, wanted to tell? Um, let's just start sharing those in the chat and I may call on someone and you can just say, no, 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 not me, not me, but give me a chance to at least call on you and then maybe tell us a little bit more about your story. 
So start typing in the chat some of what you shared in your breakout group. So I live um, both very close to a state park and I also live um, very close to all the, the epicenter of all the major California fires. I live around 15 to 20 miles from Sonoma, which is where they all happen. Um, just as a reference, the epicenters of a lot of the fires that have happened in the past three or four years were mainly in like Napa and Calistoga in like the wineries. And I live like a 20 minute drive away. Um, so as a result of that, I, they didn't affect me. They didn't really pose like a major threat to my life because I live um, in an area where though I live close to a lot of nature, I live near a lot of houses and I have, I live in a city. Um, and I guess that sort of affected the way that the fire spread. So the fires didn't really um, impact me in a life-threatening way, but there was a lot of ash that came in and there were a few instances of wildfires near where I live, although they weren't big, and that affected where we live a lot because it was like all of a sudden we were like, oh, this could happen to us one day. Like, our lives could be affected by this fire too. And like the place where I live and the state park that I live next to is really special to me because I've lived here my whole life. And it's really sad knowing that like, it could be destroyed one day because of the fires that have been happening in California. Yeah. You know, I, I love that you, you know, you kept it to yourself and, you know, like you, you know, you made it clear that like, although you weren't immediately at risk, it, it created this, you know, this such a tension and a fear and suddenly this world that you love became so uncertain of like what it's going to be. And I think that's, that's a very, that's a very compelling, powerful part of your, your story. Um, and, and I, I, I find, I found it very moving. I thought it was very well done. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. And so then you can, I'm sure you could see how you can then pivot to say, you know, and that's why I'm taking this course this summer on climate change, because I, I you know, damn it, I want to protect this place. This is really important to me. I want to make sure that it's here. Um, I, I don't want to have to move from this gorgeous place. Um, and you know, there's only so many places people could move. And I know that was one of the other issues with the wildfires. People were displaced and are still displaced to this day as a result of that. So feel free to put any of the thoughts you have after tonight in the forums. Uh, we have a wonderful category for introducing yourself. Um, but for tonight, uh, if anyone does have anything else, uh, you know, feel free to share there. I put a link where you can find the training as well as the slides and uh, Citizens Climate Radio, which Peterson uh, is the host for in the chat. Uh, but for tonight, I'm going to unmute all lines. And we just thank you all for being with us in this program, in these trainings, and really taking your climate advocacy to the next level. We hope that you found tonight's training useful and empowering. and look forward to seeing you next week. So thank you, everyone, tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Peterson. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Peterson. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.